ഹലോ നമ്മൾ വേണ്ടത് ഹലോ നമ്മൾ വേണ്ടത് സോ വെൽക്കം ടു ദ എക്സ്ട്രാ ലൈവ് ഇൻട്രക്ഷൻ സെഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ ഫണ്ടമെന്റൽസ് ഓഫ് മൈക്രോ ആൻഡ് നാനോ ഫാബ്രിക്കേഷൻ ദ കോഴ്സ് ഇൻസ്ട്രക്ടർ ഫോർ ദിസ് കോഴ്സ് ആർ പ്രൊഫസർ സുസുവൻ ഓസ്റ്റി ആൻഡ് പ്രൊഫസർ ശങ്കർ സൽവരാജ ഫ്രം ഐ എസ് സി ബാംഗ്ലൂർ ഐ എം ദ പി എം ആർ എഫ് ടീച്ചിങ് അസിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് വികാസ് പാണ്ഡെ ഫ്രം ഐ ഐ ടി ജോധ്പൂർ ദിസ് ഇസ് എ ബ്രീഫ് അബൌട്ട് മീ മൈ കോൺടാക്ട് ഡീറ്റെയിൽസ് ദ യൂട്യൂബ് ചാനൽ വെർ ഓൾ ദീസ് ലിങ്ക് ഓൾ ദീസ് വീഡിയോസ് വെൽ ബി അപ്ലോഡ് and a brief profile about me so today what we are going to do is we are going to see a kind of uh, similar field to micro and nano fabrication that is micro systems fabrication technology or uh, in short mems mems fabrication technology that is very very much uh, the same as micro fabrication and nano fabrication the concepts are same and parallelly we will be covering all the all the things we have already seen in case of our micro and nano fabrication so it is a miniaturized system realized in a silicon wafer by incorporating micro sensors or micro, when we are talking about micro that means these dimensions are in the range of micrometers so they can be micro sensors micro actuators or mechanical or fluidic or optical components or their combination with electronic circuit on same or different chip so when such physical components are made on chip then it is called as micro systems fabrication technology so what is the starting point the starting point is this uh, shiny object that is silicon uh silicon dioxide sio2 in its raw form it's uh, converted to the ingot goes through the process of uh, different fabrication process like lithography and other processes and then a chip is made and this chip power the electronic we see around us so how this wafer looks like at the beginning when we start our process although there are some uh, manif- uh, this fabrication process start from silicon wafer but before this silicon wafer itself is uh, made that that we have covered in the course uh, cz process and fz processes are used but uh, the starting point for any micro nano fabrication engineer is a silicon wafer it will look uh, like this is a shiny in wafer a thin plate you can say very thin plate that's why it's called as wafer how to identify what it is what it signifies is that if it is a simple circle with a cut single cut on one side that will be a 111 p type wafer if it is having another cut adjacent to it, the secondary flag then it will be a 111 n type wafer similarly if the cut is uh, the secondary cut is at 90 degree with the primary cut it will be 100 p type if wafer and if it is diametrically opposite to each other the cuts are diametrically opposite to each other that means it is 100 wafer having n type docking so this whole process is done uh, the whole process of this micro fabrication is done in clean room so what is a clean room it's an environment free from dust and other contaminants used chiefly or like the per- clear cut purpose is for manufacturing of the electronic components this these are classified as uh, like
like these are classified according to the number and size of particles permitted per unit volume of area so there are some standards like us fed standard 209 that have definition as class 1 10 100 1000 10000 and 100000 okay it is defined based on the size of the 0.5 micrometer particle so it is based on the size of 0.5 micrometer particles how many in a cubic square fit Air, uh, since it is us fed standard it is defined in terms of fit then there is another uh, another way of classifying classrooms that is iso standard iso 1 2 3 4 like that and there are equivalent standards uh, these have equivalent in the fed standard like iso 3 is equal to class 1 of a fed standard so here the volume de is defined in terms of per particles per cubic meter and if you see in this sequence it is defined by 0 0.1 micro the number of particles in point of 0 0.1 micron available in the in one meter cube of the air in this clean room so if there they are 10 there will be iso 1 if 100 that means uh, 10 to the power 2 iso 2 10 to the power 3 it is iso 3 like so how a clean room looks like like this is a class 1000 clean room so you see all uh, everything is closed laminar flow is maintained all the uh, environment is fully controlled using uh, filters air filters and laminar airflow is maintained to have a uh, controlled environment light everything is controlled or if you see some other this is the entry uh, entry of a clean room in which uh, before entering it is uh, air is blown uh, over the person to clean any dust particle they might be carrying to further improve the uh, to improve and maintain the quality of the clean room or in some cases uh, maintaining the uh, like maintaining some very high standards like uh, class 1 or class 100 clean room for example it's very difficult to maintain the whole room as class 100 so it may happen that uh, the whole room is maintained at class 1000 but uh, wet benches like uh, this uh, closed closed wet benches or closed area can be maintained at as a class 100 so uh, we can have uh, one uh, different classes in one single fabrication facility also different classes of clean rooms so what uh, is to be done inside a clean room before entering the clean room only enter through enter room no shortcuts so that is uh, where a bench is kept and you have to uh, move from over it and before that you have to check everything and proper entry point should be used no shortcuts what Walking through tacky mats to clean soles of shoes, wearing shoe covers, wearing clean room garments like frock or bunny suits, wearing a cap and beard cover if necessary, gloves if uh, if you are going to touch anything, or if you are taking any tool with you, it has to be cleaned, wiped properly before entering. What not to do in a clean room? Uh, the clean room garments should not be removed inside the clean room no unnecessary po uh, paper products or paper bags should be brought inside the clean room since they will contain dust no wooden pallets leather or wood handled products okay no cardboard box or pack peanuts no pencil eraser only pens are allowed since pencil and eraser 
can have dust particles. Uh, no unclean or rusty tools are to be kept inside or brought inside. No food, no drink, no chewing gum, no excessive or dangling jewelry. And uh, if you are using, uh, when you are wearing the bunny suit or the PP suit uh, to check the watch, we don't have to remove it, but uh, check the wall clock within the clear room. So these are some of the practices that we have to do. So such uh, good uh, standards are maintained because people working there have to follow these do's and don'ts in a clean room. And as such, the standards of uh, this particles and cleanliness is maintained. So now, once we are starting in a clean environment, then the next thing is we will clean the wafer that we started with because it can also contain some contaminants. So why cleaning is required? Because they can have stains like methyl alcohol, acetone, trichloride, any stain can be there with, uh, from the previous process that has been done or during transportation or since it was not all, it might not have always been kept in a very clean environment. Dust from operator equipment, smoke particles even are contact them. So what are the sources of contaminants that can occur? First is the location. Second is the attire that we are uh, wearing, construction nearby, electrostatic charge that might be developing over it. Wafer handling, while handling also many a times we handle it with tweezer. Some person might handle it directly, though wearing a glove, but still that will cause a stain over it. Furniture, process, stationary, chemical and operator. The op the person who operates uh, this will, will also have some contamination and they can bring the contamination in. So these wafer cleaning techniques are generally divided into two types, dry and wet cleaning. In dry cleaning, So in dry cleaning, water usage is not there. I think it's missing something. Okay. In dry cleaning, uh, water usage is not there. In wet cleaning, particle removal is possible using uh, wet method, chemical method. I think uh, this table has gone mixed up. Okay. Uh, metal metal removal is the in case of wet cleaning environmental. This is not loaded. Anyway, uh, let's directly discuss what it is. Okay. In case of wet cleaning, chemical methods are used like uh, dipping in a chemical and then removing the particles. In dry cleaning, plasma and other things are used. We have seen this uh, in one of the classes. This is just a combination of all those. There is a problem with wet cleaning that it is not uh, having good throughput that is we have to process serially in case of dry cleaning where plasma and these things are used we can have batch processes but uh, again uh, process rep repeatability is better in case of uh, wet cleaning compared to dry cleaning but uh, the environmental contamination is different for different kind of cleaning techniques so what are some popular cleaning methods? 
वन इज कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ आर सी ए वन एंड आर सी ए टू सेकेंड इज वेपर क्लीनिंग थर्मल ट्रीटमेंट दैट इज बेकिंग एट थाउजेंड डिग्री इन वैक्यूम और इन ऑक्सीजन सो दैट वट एवर इज द ऑक्सीडाइज एंड गोज अवे प्लाज्मा और और ग्लो डिस्चार्ज मेथड दैट इज द ड्राई क्लीनिंग फ्रेन्स विद और विदाउट ऑक्सीजन आर यूज टू क्लीन द सरफेस मैकेनिकल मेथड्स लाइक अल्ट्रासोनिक एजिटेशन पॉलिशिंग विथ एम्ब्रेसिव कंपाउंड वेयर इट इज वेरी सिमिलर टू सी एम पी मेथड दैट वी डिस्कस डे बिफोर यू स्टडी और सुपर क्रिटिक क्रिटिकल क्लीनिंग स्पेशली फॉर माइक्रो स्ट्रक्चर क्लीनिंग वेयर वी हैव फिजिकल स्ट्रक्चर्स बिकॉज इन इन दिस सुपर सी ओ टू इज यूज इन लिक्विड फॉर्म विच विल इजिली रिमूव द पार्टिकल्स ओके सो वन ऑफ द कॉमन और द मोस्ट यूज मेथड इज आर सी कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ आर सी वन एंड आर सी ओ टू आर सी वन इन इज एमोनियम पेरोक्साइड एमोनिया एमोनिया हाइड्रोजन पेरोक्साइड एंड वाटर इज मिक्स एंड दिस इज डन एट एट्टी डिग्री सेल्सियस इट रिमूव पार्टिकल इट रिमूव पॉलीमेरिक और ऑर्गेनिक मेटेरियल एंड मेक्स द सेल सेटस हाइड्रोफेलिक सो ए थिन लेयर ऑफ ऑक्साइड विल फॉर्म ऑन द सर्फेस ऑफ सिलिकन एंड एज सच इट विल रिमेन हाइड्रोफेलिक दिस प्रोसेस वॉज डेवलप्ड बाई डब्ल्यू कर्न इन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी फाइव वाइल वर्किंग फॉर रेडियो कॉर्पोरेशन ऑफ अमेरिका दैट्स वाई इट्स कॉल्ड एज आर सी ए ऑल दो नाउ इट इज इट इज इवन कॉल्ड एज एस सी वन एंड एस सी टू स्टैंडर्ड क्लीनिंग प्रोसेस वन और टू ओके देन द सेकेंड पार्ट दैट इज आर सी आर सी ए टू इन विथ एच सी एल हाइड्रोजन पेरोक्साइड एंड वाटर दे आर मिक्सड अगेन ऑपरेटेड एट्टी डिग्री सेल्सियस दिस रिमूव मेटल कॉन्टेमिनेस एंड मेक्स द सर्फेस हाइड्रोफेलिक सो आफ्टर दिस प्रोसेस नो वाटर विल बी स्टिकिंग ऑन द सर्फेस एंड वी नो दैट इट हैज इट रिमूव द ऑक्साइड लेयर दैट वॉज फॉर्म इन द आर सी वन प्रोसेस देन देर इज अनदर मेथड दैट इज ऑल्सो कॉमनली यूज दैट इज पिराना क्लीनिंग दिस इज जनरली यूज वेयर सम ऑर्गेनिक कॉन्टेमिनेंट्स हैव कम टू द सर्फेस ऑफ आवर वेफर so it is a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide both are a highly oxidizing agent in ratio of 3 is to 1 it is uh, extremely corrosive to organic materials it was earlier developed to clean utensils but uh, after finding its applicability this process uh, was used in cleaning of the wafers this process can result in explosion or injury and must be handled extremely carefully okay. its name comes from uh, a fish called piranha from amazon basin that is that can eat you know like human of 80 kg in 5 minutes it's uh, like they attack together and they eat anything that's why the name then one super critical cleaning is talking about that is where super critical <coughs> super critical fluid like co2 which has a uh, critical point in which it remains as both liquid as well as gaseous form is used in super critical cleaning in this um, it is uh, like the wafer is dipped into the co2 supercritical co2 this enables complete removal of organic and inorganic contaminants since is a gas and in liquid form so it can penetrate anywhere have very good uh, liquid like solvency properties as well as gas like diffusion that's why uh, it is and as well as it is viscous so it is very easily able to penetrate to any place and take out the particle if it is there and one of the common methods that is used in between is degreasing when we are in between some processes and some contamination we have seen uh, some contamination like oil or organic residue is left on the silicon wafer surfaces in that case 
degreasing is done there are different method people use different combinations uh, generally combination of acetone isopropyl alcohol methanol and uh, tc trichloroethylene is used tc is now it's generally done in the sequence of higher volatility to lower volatility like acetone is having high volatility followed by methanol followed by isopropyl alcohol some people do it the opposite but these are the chemicals that are used in different sequences to clean the wafers then the first process that we studied is oxidation we have the wafer that is conductive in nature now we want some oxide of we want oxide of it and the reason being uh, it has multiple applications like it can be used as a dielectric it can be used as a passivation layer it can be used as a separation between uh, electrodes it can be used as a field oxide where it is used to uh, create the effective field for our uh, different purposes like transistors and all a lot of uses is there but uh, there are two ways in which it has to be uh, transferred on the wafer one is it can be grown over the wafer that is oxidation other is deposition that we will see later on and we have uh, seen the pvd and cvd methods that can be used it is used to isolate devices and to open oxide windows for impurity doping and contact and it is used as hard hard mask at many places so under exposure of uh, oxygen environment silicon sur surface oxidizes to form silicon dioxide this uh, ability to form uh, native oxide is actually one of the primary reason for becoming uh, for silicon becoming the dominant semiconductor material used in ic technology today so what is what are the properties of si2 it is having an excellent behavior masking behavior with most of the common impurities like uh, even if it is boron phosphorus arsenic antimony it will mask them it will not allow the, the penetration of them it is a very good insulator compared to silicon which is a semiconductor and when doped it will uh, it will have better conduct uh, more conductivity but SiO2 is opposite to that very good electrical insulator having high breakdown field with excellent Youngson passivation the SI SiO2 interface always results in some electronic trap level and have some negative interface charges so this is one problem and we saw how to resolve this in the lecture it uh, SiO2 is very stable over a long period of time. It is not that uh, today it is having good insulation, uh, insulating property. After say one year or one and a half years, it becomes a bit conductive. It has very stable properties over a period of time. And the interface that we get, Si SiO2 interface, that is very like well made. It can be reproduced easily same quality same thickness everything can be obtained if we uh, if we do the same kind of processes that makes it a very versatile choice and that's why oxidation of sil uh, ox silicon oxide is very commonly used in microfabrication so how is this done oxygen or water molecule will react with silicon to form sio2 but this SiO2 will not be in the same quantity or same volume as Si since an extra molecule is being added. So if we have silicon and some part of it is consumed, if this was the original silicon, some part of it is consumed to form the oxide. So that if one micrometer of silicon is used 
an extra 1.25 micrometer will be formed. That means a total for from one micrometer SI we will get 2.25 micrometer SiO2. So that is the ratio that we get. So there are two steps that uh, occurs in case of uh, oxidation of silicon. First is diffusion of oxidizing species like uh, in dry oxidation O2 or in wet oxidation H2O through the oxide into the SiO2. Si SiO2 into it. So some SiO2 is formed, then the species will diffuse and reach till the point where still the interface is present. So see, they will reach till the silicon. Second place is oxid. Uh, second is oxidation reaction takes place and this layer will convert into SiO2. The next again diffusion will occur. Then again this layer will convert into SiO2. So uh, as you can see that at first on the top layers the reaction uh, the reaction will be very much uh, controlled by the rate of reaction but as the thickness grows it will depend on how much these spaces are diffusing inside so starting of the oxidation is reaction dependent later on it becomes diffusion dependent and if uh, it's generally that uh, this we have seen yeah so these are mostly two type of oxidation that are taking place one is dry oxidation second is wet oxidation in case of dry oxidation direct oxy oxygen is used in a furnace it may be vertical or horizontal furnace wafers are kept in quasi holder and then inside it oxygen is oxygen gas is inserted taken out and this whole thing is heated at our 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius whatever we have optimized and this process is dry oxidation in another case is where some gas like nitrogen which is inert in this process will be bubbled through H2O water and will go in the chamber so it will carry H2O particles so this is a faster process because uh, H2O molecules are smaller compared to O2 molecule and that's why this process is faster but it has one byproduct that is hydrogen that will try to after the reaction is complete will try to come out and the, as such it will lead to a poor uh, like compared to dry oxidation the wet ox oxide will be poor in quality since it has a byproduct and that is gaseous in nature and that will try to come out so the furnace looks something like this where we have different stacks these are wafers you see uh, wafers they have been stacked and kept inside the furnace which is at very high like 800 1200 1100 degrees celsius the wafer is loaded using a quash tube quash pan now uh, in a quash tube using a quash wafer holder so that it can sustain so much of heat so next comes once the oxide is formed next method is thin film deposition that is depositing some material over our uh, wafer and how is this done this can be done using two kind of methods one is chemical vapor deposition method second is physical vapor deposition method there are different type of cvd methods like atmospheric pressure cvd method low pressure chemical vapor deposition plasma enhanced cvd high pressure high density plasma cvd and if we talk about uh, although there are many pvd methods and even cvd method but these are the common ones like in pvd there is evaporation thermal evaporation and sputter deposition in which 
argon plasma is used for the depletion method. The basic difference between these methods is in case of chemical vapor depletion, there will be chemical reaction that will lead to deposition of our deposit like deposition of desired species or film. Deposition of film. Whereas in case of PVD, the material is already present. Present and physically transferred. Transferred on our substrate. Okay. So, what is the basic difference in PVD? Uh, like uh, PVD will have thermal evaporation, electron beam evaporation, sputtering. Uh, CVD have this uh, APCVD, LPCVD, uh, PECVD, SD, PCVD, that is high density plasma CVD, and ALD. We have covered ALD in details uh, in one of the class. So, in case of chemical vapor deposition, CVD re reactants are in reactant gases generally get because. Uh, the reaction has to take place on the surface of the wafer. So they are in the form of gases. They are introduced in the, the chamber. Reaction of the gases in the wafer result in layer deposition. And then uh, the byproducts will move out and only the uh, species of our interest will remain there. Whereas in case of physical vapor deposition, we already have the material we are just changing its state say it is in form of granule we will evaporate it to form a uh, layer of metal thin layer fine we have a dielectric uh, in form of a circular coin kind of uh, structure we will sputter it and we will deposit a layer of it over it over our vapor such kind of things are done in physical vapor deposition they are generally done using evaporation. That's the common PVD method. Second is sputtering. Mostly used for metal and alloy depositions. Whereas in case of uh, CVD, we are able to deposit uh, like it is a lot of materials, especially dielectrics, even silicon, SiO2, polysilicon, silicon nitride. These films are deposited using CVD methods. Evaporation source in case of uh, this PVD method, the evaporation sources can be uh, like electron beam or they can be thermal in nature. That is, they are heated using resistive heating. So it is heated, it is uh, heated to such a temperature that the material evaporates. To measure the thickness of these materials, film thickness, how much it is, and a quartz crystal monitor is used on which along with the wafer, this material will be deposited and its weight will change. And once the weight changes, we will see the, uh, these changes will be visible in, uh, by the change in the piezoelectric, uh, that will lead to change in the piezoelectric property of the crystal, quartz crystal leading to understanding how much material has been deposited. So some of the PVD films are from metals, alloys, dielectric, ceramic, semiconductor, inorganic compounds, polymers. A lot of these can be deposited. So it is simply like the source is solid or liquid. Evaporation occurs. It converts it into gas phase. It is transported and deposited over gas or plasma and it is transported and deposited over our material and it solidifies and it again converts into a solid phase. So these are some of the materials that are depo deposited like they can be in form of small granules, salt kind of form, powder, pellets, such 
uh, they can be found in different structures so if we compare the pvd processes thermal evaporation is the most cost effective low cost uh, low cost uh, way to deposit materials and especially uh, metals like silver gold sometimes some semiconductors like indium and these things are not indium sorry indigo indigo is a compound semiconductor that is also deposited and some having a low or adequate melting point they can be deposited but in generally they are used for metals in case uh, in this case since we when we are talking about compounds the compounds will be difficult to deposit since they will have varying uh, first is they have high melting point since they are in a stable state second is they can have varying like a range of melting points and to uh, at high temperature some some of these materials might disintegrate also getting enough activation energy that's why it uh, it is not preferred for compounds as well as the coating addition is not as good as good as other pvd processes whereas in case of sputtering it has better coating addition than vacuum or thermal evaporation all these processes occur in uh, vacuum chambers okay it can be used to coat compounds but it has slower deposition rate and more difficult to control the process the rate of deposition is uh, very difficult to control in case of sputtering one uh, some of the common coating materials are al203 gold chromium molybdenum sio2 silicon nitride so we have made an oxide and then we can use it to deposit over another material that we cannot directly grow over okay silicon nitride titanium carbide titanium nitride all these things can be deposited using sputtering then iron iron plating and cluster deposition it has better coverage and coating addition of uh, like one of the best amongst pvd but it is most complex process control and have hi uh, higher deposition rate compared to sputtering but uh, since it is complex the cost is higher as well as it is difficult to control so materials like uh, silver gold chromium molybdenum silicon nitride these things can be used in iron plating then uh, some of the newer methods like uh, laser ablator deposition which is good for complex compound like it has a lot of molecule we are not uh, able to deposit using other methods laser ablation deposition is used for such materials and for low temperature deposition in all these some temperature can be used but where material will get damaged like ceramic uh, in that case aerosol deposition is used that will lead to uh, that will give us low temperature deposition this we have seen we have already covered this guys so some things like uh, in all this uh, we will talk about some pressures what are the different pressure like 1 to equals to 1.3 millibar they the conversions we had to know because uh, different equipments will some equipment will talk in terms of millibar some will talk in terms of tor some will talk in terms of pascals or standard atmospheric pressure such things such interconversions we have to know so let's see some thermal evaporation system like this is one of the thermal evaporation system we, we have in our lab so this is the chamber in which uh, in the back side this is the pump that is used to create the vac uh, high vacuum and the deposition uh, these are the controls i can all the control systems in this which is used to control the deposition rate and all other things this is the circuitry to 
control and in that small just to do the deposition in that small chamber we have to have all these accessories like uh, here and this is yeah this is the first pump that is used we have talked about rotary pump then above is turbo molecular pump which is used to create high vacuum this that we have talked about to increase and high vacuum is used to increase the mean free pump that is better that will lead to better deposition and less number of collision okay there is another thermal evaporation system this is a bit uh, simpler this load lock chamber from where uh, the wafer is put and then uh, slided into the main chamber and then uh, in the main chamber in this there are multiple ports and these can uh, these multiple ports can be used to deposit different materials in one go like they cannot be deposited together but in one go like without taking out the substrate one layer after another inside some deposition is going on these are vacuum systems that are uh, like turbo molecular pump and rotary pump and the transformer to power the boats so this is a live uh, deposition going on so you see below that is the material uh, in this case i think it's uh, chromium chromium or gold so that is uh, being melt it is already in molten form and it is being evaporated and deposited above where the substrate is moving and a thin layer of it is getting evaporated at the distance is somewhat in the range of five to seven centimeters and that material will get deposited slowly and the rate we will control by controlling the amount of current we are giving and here it is purely resistive heating that is taking place just like a heater it is heated and that is mold, uh, melted and evaporated over it so now if we talk about other that is uh, sputtering in case of sputtering targets are used like you see in this case this is platinum zinc zirconium or copper or titanium oxide or tantalum oxide these targets are used directly and you see the ring kind of structure that shows the deposition uh, has all some material has already been removed using some deposition here also you see ring kind of structures that are forming these are the like these are the parts from where some material has already been removed so the main difference is the pressure although for sputtering also first a high pressure is made like uh, but that is just for cleanliness one uh, like the deposition will not take place at higher temperature uh, so not temperature sorry pressure the deposition will not take place at higher pressure it will be at a slightly lower pressure that is in the range of 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to minus 3 uh, minus 2 but uh, different kind of uh, this sources are used like dc dc is generally used for metals or conductive materials where we cannot have conductive metal we have dielectrics or insulators in that case we have seen that uh, due to this tc a capacitive build up forms that's why we replace this uh, source with rf or we can have a pulse dc that is that will again solve the problem and then we have magnetron a uh, magnetic field is used to assist the uh, deposition whereas in case of thermal evaporation it can be what most common is thermal uh, that is resistive then we can have electron beam where elect electron beam is used to heat the material instead of uh, 
uh, current or it can be pul pulsed ledger that is a ledger that will melt it and deposit it so the principle for sputtering is that uh, the gas is inserted generally argon and that will come and it will be ionized by the high tc voltage plus and minus that's happening and this will knock out some of the uh, surface atoms or molecules and take it towards the anode that is the positive and where we have kept the substrate and it will get deposited and this argon will again get free and it will again continue the process and take part in the process so as such uh, it is like throwing uh, some pebbles into the mud where the mud will come out and the pebbles will remain undisturbed like they will they can be reused so if it is done at a lower temperature uh, lower pressure then why we need high uh, very high uh, what you say very high pressure at first because we don't want any other material to be lingering around to be disturbing our process that's why vacuum is first created for longer mean free path okay but in case of uh, in case uh, of uh, ulsi or vlsi systems where we don't want to go for high temperature there we there most of the processes have now been replaced by uh, thermal uh, thermal or e-beam evaporation is not used sputtering is preferred but even if we talk about cvd that is also mostly a high temperature process so sputtering is one of the preferred processes nowadays due to the fact that we can do it in at low temperature sputtering and ald is one another process that can be done at lower process and to enhance the sputtering magnetic focusing is used that is magnetron sputter okay these details let's skip this we have seen okay so this is one of the sputtering system we have in which again we have a high uh, <clears throat> to attain the high uh, vacuum we have the turbo molecular pump this is the rotary pump that will assist it then we have uh, you see here in this case we are reaching to 10 to the power minus 6 minus 7 range and then we are inserting uh, inserting the wafer from here i think uh, loading is also yeah so such uh, the wafers are loaded over such metal plates and inserted inside and then yeah insert it to the main chamber and then the deposition takes place <coughs> So this is the uh, that same wafer has been loaded here it is rotating and the plasma is formed and that material is knocked out and deposited over it so the concept is very similar it is just that the means have changed in case of uh, thermal evaporation the means was by evaporating it by heating it so much that it evaporates here we are using plasma to knock out the material material in form of plasma and deposit overall our desired substrate so in case of evaporation 
it has low energy atoms in sputtering we have high energy atoms for evaporation when the deposition is going on we need very high vacuum path that will lead to very few collisions its line of sight deposition very straight and very uh, there are less at uh, least chances of gas entering since no gas is involved deposition rate can be controlled by the rate of heating we are doing the grain size that forms the surface is generally formed using grain uh, like by combination of grain that will be larger and that's why there will be fewer orientations so they will be random okay and it has poor adhesion whereas if we are talking about sputtering it is having high energy since we are using plasma it is being hit so it will deposit at with a high energy low vacuum is required plasma bath here collision is much more compared to evaporation line of sight is not necessary because there will be some uh, deposition outside line of sight also uh, there are chances of gas in the film deposition rate cannot be varied much since uh, it is mostly dependent on the energy and uh, energy is again dependent on the voltage we are giving and at lower voltages we will not get the plasma and we cannot go beyond the voltage so it's like very less uh, less option of changes okay but uh, the grain size is smaller sometimes even uh, in nano size we get we have many grain orientations we can get and it has better adhesion so we have covered okay yeah so these are some uh, cvd methods like this is a simple ap cvd atmospheric pressure cvd where uh, the whole equipment is uh, at the uh, atmospheric level okay then this is uh, lp cvd low pressure cvd where inside this the press a low pressure is maintained and as such the deposition is easier uh, since uh, there are less molecules less other molecules disturbing and it uh, the flow is uh, these are the precursors that through which the gases flow and these gases will react inside and form the material overall at uh, uh, overall vessel now we have uh, then comes one another uh, once we have deposited then we need to pattern this for different purposes like uh, to to make our source train and other like for different purpose we we don't need one single layer layer by layer that is done but now we want layers in specific region not everywhere to do that we go for a method called as lithography so as i showed in the one of the class also like it is a process of patterning one over another so you see a mask is used here then the paint is used and it's removed so it creates a pattern and the combination gives us one single thing so very similarly if you see the chips uh, where we see different patterns they have been made in multiple layers one by one one over another okay. and this is done using the uh, lithography technique so lith lithography generally comes from the word lithos that means stone and graphia that means writing so it is it comes from the concept that uh, originally uh, on this stone where we have to write something stencils were used okay, uh, made of stone only and paint and colors were used to make the pattern and from here this term lithography comes now, uh, nowadays since we have got got sophisticated now instead of paint we are using light as our source of writing light and electrons and the mask from stone has uh, shifted to like the quast and chromium or in some cases software control so there are mainly two two most commonly used lithography techniques like photolithography and electron beam lithography so 
we'll see a bit of about photolithography that is one of the common ones and the concept of electron beam lithography is also very similar except for uh, the source that is instead of light it becomes electron so photolithography is used to uh, in microfabrication to transfer patterns onto a substrate using light and photoways so photolithography is very critical um, step in manufacturing of ic and other microelectronic devices so okay so if we see this silicon substrate we have to create a pattern like that so a photo mask is used and then from over it light is used to pattern it uh, like to replicate this met, uh, metal pattern over our silicon this light and that will create the pattern over it so what are the processes involved in it is not that simple that using light we can do that so the process is first we prepare the substrate like clean deposit whatever we want to pattern and everything then we apply a photo resin that is photosensitive material then we expose the photo resin to to light but under the mask only the areas that we want to remove or to keep based on our photo resin then we develop the photo resin just like we develop we used to develop reels in uh, like 90s or early 2000s similar to that it is developed where the pattern will fo form over the photo resin so now the photo resin is pattern not our material then we etch the substrate and then we remove the photo resin so photo resin is pattern using light and then photo resin acts as a mask for the subsequent etching and we get the desired pattern and then once the work is done we remove the photo resin so one of the key thing here is the mask that is used it's the template that that is designed using softwares what we want to make over our wafer that is designed using uh, tcad softwares and then they are printed using uh, like uh, they have transparent areas with the patterns over them so like this is one uh, one mask that is on here that is used to develop uh, create the pattern on the wafer so next important thing is photo resist so what is this photo resist it is a light sensitive material used to produce pattern layer on a substrate they are mainly of two types that uh, one is positive another is negative so this material will be poured over our wafer and the wafer will be rotated such that we get a uniform thin layer of photo resin and once that is done we will uh, if you see a thin la layer this layer will be in according to our need it can be in microns 1 to 20 microns just in, in case of electron beam lithography we can have thinner layers okay next comes the light exposure it is done using uh, mostly we call this instrument as uh, mask aligner and ex uh, exposure is also done here so mask and wafer is aligned in this system and uh, they are aligned and then light is uv light generally of 365 nanometer or 405 nanometer according to our need is shown over it and then the area that is having the pattern will block the light other area will allow the light to fall on the photo resist and we will be able to make our pattern next comes developing it to get our pattern so developer is a solution that is specific to our photo resist that can develop uh, that can remove the exposed or unexposed area based on the type of photo resist if it is positive 
it will remove the area uh, that is exposed in case it is negative it will remove the area that is unexposed okay so it is dipped into and then we will see our pattern then we will pass it and then uh, dry it and we will get our pattern but this pattern is is of photoresist not the material that we want so if we see the starting wafer was like this then it uh, it is coated with a metal here then after the whole lithography process we have these uh, patterns so uh, once these uh, patterns were made over it then it was etched out the rest part was etched out and then the photoresist was removed using uh, stripper so it will work in such uh, yellow rooms so we can see the whole process here like it is a coated wafer that is being processed here you know, coated with uh, the metal so it is going to be now coated with the photoresist that is uh, a positive photoresist that is a uh, photo sensitive material is fixed over it and hold using vacuum Now the photorist is poured over it. Then it will be rotated. then it's uh, baked for some time so that uh, like it is just heated for some time so that it dries it's not heated too much it is just heated adequately then it's being uh, this mask is being fit into the wafer uh, into the mask liner and then the next thing is that the wafer will be taken from here and kept in there And the patterns will be aligned over it and then it will be exposed so you, now you see this is coming close to our mask mask and wafer are getting close and then it is coming so as we have seen in uh, the class on lithography that there can be three different kind of photolithography one is contact proximity and projection so this is simply a proximity lithography where it is coming very close but not having a hard contact then it will be taken into developer where it will be uh, we will see the patterns coming it's washed and dried still gold is there now it will be inspected that uh, whether it is um, whether it was fine or not and then the lithography process is over next is we will remove the materials that are left 
okay so it is etching is uh, basically the process of removing substrate material to create desired pattern so we have material uh, let's do a cross section so we have this wafer say silicon over with which we deposited say some metal okay now using lithography we have made some patterns like this 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 okay so this is photo right so now but we don't we are not interested in pattern of photo we are interested in pat the pattern of metal so next is we have to remove this metal and that that will give us the desired pattern and then later on we will remove the pr so it is just a sacrificial layer that that uh, pr is just a sacrificial layer that we are using to pattern okay so there uh, this etching can be done using wet or dry method wet is simply where the whole wafer will be uh, put inside uh, the chemical whereas dry etching is a process in which it will be done using plasma as we have covered in the uh, week nine week nine or ten so we uh, we have seen this that uh, yeah two uh, important things are isotropic and is and isotropic etching isotropic is in which material is removed uniformly in all the direction and this is something we don't want we want an isotropic that means material is removed in one direction one direction is preferred compared to other direction that means either it will be etching out uh, in the vertical direction or in the horizontal direction or at some angle that re uh, results into high aspect ratio structures and this is what we want otherwise we will have um, although we were thinking a pattern like this but we will get a pattern like this so we don't want this we want this and this can be achieved using an isotropy isotropication is not always good so what are the process involved in case of wet etching first is cleaning that is if some surface contamination is there clean it like we saw in the previous one uh, even after lithography after developing we drains into di dried it properly second is masking that uh, we did using uh, lithography photo resist metal or oxide it depends on our purpose sometimes uh, for, uh, this photo resist is not enough to sustain the chemical that we are going to use so it can be that uh, over our desired material we will deposit a layer of sio2 then we deposit photo resist then we pattern the sio2 using the photo resist then this sio2 will work as the mask for the next process so this can be done. so according to our need and uh, the chemical we are going to use we will use the this uh, protective layer or the mask then we will immerse the substrate into the etching solution for a control time we know uh, we have to know that how much thickness is there so um, and thickness we know from our deposition techniques like cvd or pvd whatever we have used from there we know that we have deposited this thickness and we have to remove that to work okay then we clean the masking layer and any etchant if it is left will be removed so these are simple process steps so what happens in this case the reactants diffuse on the film reaction takes place and then the byproducts again diffuse back into the solution and this continues till the film etches out it mainly consists of three process that is mass transport of reactants through boundary condition to the surface to be etched then reaction between reactant and the film to be etched at the surface then 
third is mass transport transport of reaction uh, reaction product from surface through the surface boundary okay. so there are some figure of merit that is uh, associated with this one is h rate and is h rate uniformity then selectivity and anisotropy so what is h selectivity that is ratio of etching rate between different materials higher the better that means if we have to remove this film and we are not interested in removing the mask but anyway it will remove a bit of mask we but we want that it should remove uh, if it is removing like uh, one micron of uh, mask it should remove very minimal of the uh, one micron of the film it should remove very minimal amount of the mass that is maybe one or two nanometers then it is it's selective then second is anisotropy which is um, for any chemical we will consider two kind of etching rates one is in the vertical direction so r vertical and one is in the horizontal direction how it is etching. so r horizontal so it is the ratio of horizontal etch rate to vertical etch rate so for isotropic etching that is uniform etching in all the direction it will be one that is horizontal and vertical are same so we are getting a uh, circular kind of pattern okay then for uh, somewhat an isotropic it will be between one to zero so if you see this pattern it is an isotropic but not perfect because some under uh, undercut is still there but for an a completely an isotropic i think the horizontal x rate is zero and that gives us uh, the an isotropy as zero and we will get a perfect structure like this so there are different kind of wet etching solution this is a list like uh, for different material which are uh, which of the etchants are used there it's uh, there are different 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 uh, materials and sometimes we have to see that uh, what are the other films that other films or what is the substrate that we are dealing with so according to that we will ch uh, choose the etching that we have to use for our purpose so again uh, these are some more etching solution then there is another way that is plain selective etching where the etching stops itself like koh or team koh or tema in this case they are selective to certain due to the atomic structure they are selective towards some plane of the silicon and stop at some specific plane specific angle okay like uh, koh is uh, having uh, edge selectivity towards 100 plane whereas when it encounters the 111 plane it stops and the angle between these planes is 54.74 degrees this will stop at that angle so such a structure will automatically form we don't have to worry about it second is dry etching so how is this done it's a process of removing material using plasma or reactive ion so like now dry etching is two types plasma and reactive ion RIE. again a reactive ion is further uh, modified to give us deep reactive ion etching that uh, uses the boss process that we discussed that uh, a, a consecutive layer of passivation removal passivation removal passivation removal that will give very good spectral ratio over multiple times dry etching is uh, quite crucial in microfabrication it as it allows for precise removal of materials and creation of microscale feature with high spec ratio and good uniformity unlike the uh, wet etching so 
as i said plasma h where plasma is used reactive ion h where ions uh, reactive like some reactive uh, sites are used reactive uh, ions like oxygen or chlorine can be used for the h deep reactive ion is a variation of reactive ion h that allows for creating deep high spectral structure it is simply done by etching and passivation etching and passivation then uh, there are some other motivation uh, other modification of this like ion beam etching so where ions are used uh, in form of beam to propel uh, to etch out specific area so it is uh, very slow and expensive as it will it is like writing one one point at the and that also it is softer control but it will have a very precise control over its property or vapor phase etching which uh, involves exposing the surface to a vapor of a reactive gas which reacts with the surface and removes material so in this case a chemical reaction is taking place ideally but it is in form of gas plasma etching so these are some setups that are used like reactive ion etching setup deep reactive ion so what happens in case of deep reactive ion is that first reactive ion etching will be done then a layer of passivation will be deposited then again reactive ion etching will be done so it will make it big then next and this will keep on happening and so we can see something some structures like this where we can make a pillar we can make a good drain uh, trench kind of structures using deep, deep reactive ion so these are the overview of the processes that are used in micro and nano fabrication and mems technology so for any questions if you have you can ask any questions so uh, next we will continue with the topic that is the process integration in which how these different processes are done in tandem with each other that we are studying we saw the design uh, like technology aware design and these things in the previous class that we will continue in the next class that is the week 12 so thank you all see you all in the next class that will be again on Thursday Sunday. Thank you.